The energy conversion process is the essential function of any power plant. It involves the transformation of potential energy contained in fuel into thermal energy in steam. The thermal energy in steam is converted into mechanical energy, which is then turned into electrical energy. A critical step in the process is the conversion of thermal energy into mechanical energy. This step is accomplished in the turbine section of the plant cycle. As a power plant operator, your responsibilities include helping to ensure that the turbines in your plant operate properly and efficiently. In the next four units, we'll examine how the energy in steam is converted into mechanical energy by the turbine. We'll also talk about your responsibilities in maintaining proper and efficient turbine operations. We'll look at how turbines are constructed and the basic principles governing the process of energy conversion in the turbine. We'll see how turbines are lubricated and we'll examine turbine valves. Finally, we'll talk about protection and control devices as well as your role in turbine operation. The information we'll cover applies to turbines in general. So during your study of turbines over the next four units, apply the information you learn to your plant and its turbines. Consult with your instructor and supervisors to familiarize yourself with turbine operations specific to your plant. In this first unit on turbines, we're going to look at turbine construction and the basic principles of turbine operation. We'll examine the major turbine components and how those components work together to turn thermal energy into mechanical energy. We'll look at turbine cylinder arrangements, and finally, we'll discuss the turbine efficiency and how it fits into the steam cycle. We'll begin with a review of the basic turbine components. But first, let's talk about your responsibilities as an operator. Since turbines have a direct effect on almost every part of the steam cycle, turbine operation must be coordinated with all other plant functions. As an operator, you'll be concerned with monitoring turbine operation in the control room as well as on the turbine deck. In a plant's control room, operators monitor and control start-up and shutdown procedures of the turbine and maintain proper heat-up and cool-down rates. They watch the difference in temperature and pressure between steam supplies to the inlet of the turbine and the turbine parts. They also ensure that operation of turbines is maintained within design specifications. For example, expansion and contraction are constantly observed by the plant's operators to make sure the turbine isn't damaged due to differential expansion or contraction between the turbine rotor and casing and they ensure that turbine and generator vibrations are within design limits. These operators are in the process of shutting down a turbine. The two operators are working together to shut the unit down so the load on the turbine and the boiler are brought down together and steam flow through the system is kept in balance. Operators must coordinate their efforts in all phases of turbine control. Every operator must be aware of how an action he takes may affect any component or portion of the steam cycle. While turbines are being operated and monitored from the control room, operators on the turbine deck periodically check lube oil temperature and pressure and gland seal pressure. In other areas of the plant, they check turbine drains to ensure that they're operating properly. Operators are also called upon to adjust valve positions and system lineups which affect turbine operation. In order to keep turbines running efficiently, all operations must be monitored continually by plant operators. Everything from steam inlet to turbine exhaust, from the largest to the smallest of turbine components, rotation, vibration, temperature, and pressure. Because you play an important role in maintaining efficient turbine operation, you have to become familiar with the components of the turbines in your plant. Let's take a look at a typical single cylinder turbine and identify its major parts. On the outside, we can see the turbine casing or shell. The turbine casing contains the inner turbine components. Inside, attached to the turbine casing, are the fixed or stationary blades which direct steam through the turbine. Also inside the casing is the main element of the turbine, the rotor. The rotor consists of a shaft and attached blading. 
This blading is often referred to as moving blading. Supporting the rotor on each end are two journal bearings and one thrust bearing, which position the rotor within the casing. The steam that is supplied to the turbine inlet passes through the turbine blading, causing the moving blades and the shaft to rotate. In this way, the steam's energy is turned into mechanical energy. In addition to the turbine casing, the fixed blading, the bearings, and the rotor, there are the turbine control valves and stop valves. The control valves and stop valves lead to the turbine inlet. Control valves, which may also be called governor valves, regulate the amount of steam and thereby the amount of energy that the turbine receives. Stop valves, also referred to as throttle valves, admit steam to the control valves and provide a secondary means of protection by closing if control valves should fail to operate properly or if it's necessary to shut down the turbine for any other reason. All these turbine components function together to convert the energy found in steam into usable mechanical energy, which can then be turned into electricity. We'll see how these components actually turn thermal energy into mechanical energy. But now, why don't we pause so you can review the material on operator responsibilities and turbine components in your text and answer the text questions. And be sure to ask your instructor to answer any questions you have on that material. This is a definition which does explain what a turbine is, but it doesn't explain how a turbine converts the energy in steam into mechanical energy. As a power plant operator, it's important for you to know how the components of a turbine function together to produce mechanical energy. Understanding how a turbine works will help you become alert to signs that tell you something may be malfunctioning in the turbine portion of the steam cycle. So let's see if we can find a definition for a turbine that comes a little closer to an explanation of turbine fundamentals. Turbine. A rotary engine actuated by the reaction or impulse of a current or fluid such as water or steam, subject to pressure and usually made with a series of curved vanes on a central rotating spindle. Well, that seems like a lot to handle, but it does come closer to what we're looking for. Why don't we take a closer look at what the definition actually means? The definition says, A rotary engine. A rotary engine is an engine that produces rotating mechanical energy. This mechanical energy is the rotation of the turbine shaft and its blading. Actuated by the impulse or reaction of a current or fluid. The fluid is steam, and the turbine blading directs the steam in such a way that it either pushes the moving blading in a direction opposite to its flow, or its impact causes the blades to move. Subject to pressure. This means that in order for the steam to move through the turbine, there must be a pressure differential, because fluid flows from a high pressure area to an area of lower pressure. Usually made with a series of curved vanes on a central rotating spindle. The curved vanes are the moving blades, which are sometimes called buckets. The central rotating spindle is the rotor shaft. From this definition, we can begin to see how the turbine works to convert the energy in steam into rotating mechanical energy. But the definition doesn't completely explain how this is accomplished. So let's examine this process a little closer. The most important concept of the turbine's energy conversion process is embodied in the turbine blading. The fixed blades and the moving blades of the turbine act together to convert the energy of steam into rotating mechanical energy. As you should know, the thermal energy of steam is measured by its enthalpy. The enthalpy of steam is due to both the steam's temperature and its pressure. The turbine blades convert the enthalpy of the steam into kinetic energy by causing the steam to speed up or gain velocity. 
The moving blades convert the kinetic energy in the moving steam into the mechanical energy of rotor rotation. Let's look at the fixed blades and then the moving blades of a typical turbine so we can see how the energy conversion process is accomplished. Each set of fixed blades is often referred to as a diaphragm. The outer ring of the diaphragm attaches the row of fixed blades to the turbine casing. The turbine shaft passes through the inner ring of the diaphragm. As you can see, each diaphragm and its row of fixed blades are constructed in halves so that they can be installed and removed from the turbine. If we look inside the outer ring of the diaphragm and along the fixed blading, we can see how the shape of the blades can convert the energy of steam into kinetic energy. The fixed blades have a converging nozzle shape, so you may hear them called nozzles. Steam passes through the fixed blades in this direction, from an area of high pressure to a low pressure area. The converging shape of the blades makes the space between them smaller at the exhaust than at the inlet. This blading arrangement creates a nozzle between the blades. As steam passes through the blades from the wider area to a decreasing area, its enthalpy decreases. Because the blades are in a fixed position, the energy in the steam is converted to an increase in steam velocity. The steam leaving the fixed blades has a very high velocity and consequently a great deal of kinetic energy. The kinetic energy in the steam can now be transferred to the moving blading of the rotor. The moving blades convert the kinetic energy of the steam delivered to them by the fixed blades into the mechanical energy of rotor rotation. The blades can be shaped in various ways to accomplish the conversion from kinetic energy to mechanical energy. They can be reaction type blades, impulse type blades or a combination of both types. The moving blades can be attached to the shaft of the rotor on discs called wheels. Along the outer rim of the blading is a metal band called shrouding which ties the blades together. Let's look inside the shrouding and along the blades so we can see how the energy conversion takes place. This row of moving blading is the reaction type. As you can see these blades are similar to the fixed blades in that they are nozzle shaped. Steam enters the reaction blading here and exits here. The steam possesses energy in two forms, kinetic energy and thermal energy. The amount of kinetic energy is due to the velocity of the steam. So the way that velocity changes as steam passes through the blades is important. We'll look at how velocity changes in a moment. The thermal energy, on the other hand, is measured by the enthalpy of the steam. The amount of enthalpy in the steam is affected by both the temperature and pressure of the steam. The effects produced by steam as it passes through the blades are a little easier to understand in terms of the changes in pressure. So we'll concentrate on those changes. But keep in mind that temperature also changes. This graph shows how pressure and velocity change as steam passes through one row of fixed blades followed by one row of reaction type moving blades. One row of fixed blades and one row of moving blades are called a stage. As steam passes through the fixed blades, its velocity increases and its pressure decreases as the space between the blades narrows. On the other hand, as the steam passes through the moving blades, both pressure and velocity decrease. This is because energy is given up to push the blades. The pressure and velocity decrease gives the blades a kickback or reaction force which helps drive the rotor causing it to rotate. This is the other type of moving blading, impulse blading. In this type of blading the area where the steam enters is the same size as the area where it exits. High velocity steam from the fixed blades enters the moving impulse blades and impinges upon or pushes against them, causing the wheel and the shaft to rotate. As the steam hits the blading, its velocity decreases as this energy is given up. However, since the area where the steam leaves the row of blades is the same size as the area where it enters the blades, no pressure is given up. 
This graph shows how pressure and velocity change as steam passes through one stage of turbine blading in which the moving blades are the impulse type. Again, across the fixed blades, steam velocity increases and pressure decreases. Across the moving blades, steam pressure stays virtually the same because there is no difference in size between the blading inlet and outlet. But steam velocity decreases as energy is given up to cause rotation. So, in reaction type blading, as the kinetic energy in steam is converted into mechanical energy, both pressure and velocity decrease. While in impulse type blading, only velocity decreases during the conversion process. We've examined these two types of blading in terms of a single stage in which they affected a transfer of energy from the thermal energy in steam to the mechanical energy of rotor rotation. However, we know that turbines consist of many stages of blading. Let's look at graphs that illustrate how pressure and velocity change as steam passes through several stages of blading. First, we'll look at reaction type moving blades. Then we'll look at impulse type blades. Here is a series of fixed blades and reaction type moving blades. In the fixed blades, pressure decreases and velocity increases. In the moving blades, both pressure and velocity decrease. On the other hand, this graph shows a series of fixed blades and impulse type moving blades. Here, pressure decreases and velocity increases through the fixed blades. But in the moving blades, only velocity decreases. Pressure stays the same. Now, most turbines use a combination of impulse and reaction blading. A turbine is classified as impulse or reaction by the way in which the majority of the energy in the steam is given up to the moving blades. Most modern turbines use a combination of impulse and reaction blading that makes the most efficient use of the energy in the steam. The first stage of a turbine at the turbine inlet is called a control stage. The first row of fixed blades is called a nozzle block. In the control stage of most turbines, the moving blades are usually pure impulse. Through each stage, the fixed blading decreases steam pressure. Pressure is highest at the turbine inlet and lowest at the outlet. Where pressures are high, as in the control stage, impulse type blading is most efficient. Where pressures are lower, reaction type blading is most efficient. As turbine pressure drops from the inlet to the exhaust, the shape of the blades tends to shift from pure impulse to a combination that has both impulse characteristics and reaction characteristics. This combination of impulse blading in the higher pressure stages and reaction blading in the lower pressure stages is very efficient and is used to a great extent in turbines today. Well, we've seen how the turbine components convert the thermal energy in steam into kinetic energy and then into the mechanical energy of rotor rotation. Now is a good time to review this information in your text and answer the questions at the end of the section. When we come back, we'll take a look at turbine construction. Be sure to ask your instructor to answer the questions you have about turbine fundamentals. Turbines operate under very high pressures and temperatures. They must be able to withstand the great amount of stress that these high pressures and temperatures exert while making the most efficient use of steam to produce mechanical energy. As an operator, you should be familiar with turbine construction and how the principles of turbine construction contribute to safe and efficient operation. This knowledge will add to your understanding of the turbine operating procedures you'll be responsible for in your job. We're going to look at the main turbine components, the rotor assembly and the turbine casing, and see how their construction affects the energy conversion process. The turbine rotor assembly, that is the shaft and the moving blading, absorbs the energy of steam and converts it into mechanical energy in the form of rotor rotation, which is used to turn a generator. 
There are two types of turbine rotor assemblies generally found in modern power plants, disc type and drum type. We've already looked at the disc type rotor. Disc type rotors have discs called wheels, which are raised up from the shaft. The moving blades of the turbine are mounted on the wheels. On the other hand, drum type rotors have an enlarged portion of the shaft, which is called a drum. The moving blades are mounted directly onto the drum. In both types of rotors, the blades must increase in size from higher pressure areas to lower pressure areas to accommodate the expanding volume of the steam. As we mentioned earlier, the shape of the moving blades, as well as their size, vary as pressure in the turbine decreases along the shaft. Toward the lower pressure areas, you'll find most turbines have increasingly more reaction blading. It has been found that this type of blading arrangement achieves the greatest amount of efficiency from the steam as pressure decreases through the turbine. To maintain this efficiency, though, the blades must be kept as rigid as possible. The high velocity and pressure of the steam that flows through a turbine can cause a great deal of turbulence around the blading. This turbulence can cause the moving blades to vibrate, decreasing the efficiency of their operation. To dampen blade vibration, the moving blades are tied together by metal bands called shrouding. In addition to cutting down blade vibration, the shrouding also helps to contain the steam within the blades. This allows the blades to make the most efficient use of the quantity of steam that passes through the turbine. Generally, the shrouding is attached to the blading by a process called peening. On the top of each blade is a raised knob called a tenon. The shrouding is constructed with small holes which fit over the tenon of each blade. When the shrouding is attached to the blading, the tenons are hammered or peened. In effect, this rivets the shrouding to the blading so the tenon can't slip through the hole in the shrouding. Often, in the high pressure first stage of a turbine, the shrouding will be machined or constructed as an integral part of the blading. This gives the blading additional strength to absorb the great amount of energy that is transferred to it from the steam as it first enters the turbine. In the lower pressure stages of the turbine, where the blades become larger, tie wires may be used in addition to shrouding. Tie wires are metal wires that join the blades together. Tie wires provide additional protection against blade vibration when they become too large for shrouding to be totally effective. Besides causing blade vibration, the steam flow through a turbine can cause the whole rotor to move out of position Without a means to retain the rotor, high pressure and velocity could force it right out of the casing. In turbines, journal bearings and thrust bearings are used to support rotors and maintain their proper position. A rotor would usually be supported at each end of the shaft by journal bearings which maintain its radial position. Each bearing consists of a metal cylinder surrounding the shaft which keeps it from moving out of position. The rotor will also have a thrust bearing near one of the journal bearings. The thrust bearing maintains the rotor's axial position. Thrust bearings can consist of one thrust runner, which is part of the shaft, and two thrust plates. When the rotor tries to move axially, the thrust plates prevent the movement by blocking the movement of the thrust runner. Both the thrust bearing and the journal bearings are contained in bearing pedestals or standards. The pedestals are mounted on an open foundation, usually made of reinforced concrete. They are constructed so that the bearings fit into them solidly, providing a secure foundation for the rotor. Bearing pedestals also serve another function. Turbine casings are usually suspended between and supported by the pedestals. One pedestal is fixed or anchored to the foundation, and the others are placed on sliding feet or skid plates. As the turbine casing and the rotor heat up, the whole turbine assembly tends to expand. The sliding feet allow the pedestals to move so that the turbine can expand freely from its anchor point. Usually the pedestal at the low pressure end of the turbine is anchored, allowing expansion in the direction of the high pressure end. 
large turbine assemblies can expand in excess of two inches. So not only the turbine casing and rotor, but all connections to the turbine must be flexible so that the turbine's normal expansion and contraction won't be restricted. The turbine casing itself can be constructed in either of two ways, either single casing or double casing. In a single casing turbine, all the turbine elements are located within one enclosure. Single casings are usually used only in smaller turbine assemblies, where minimal expansion of the steam occurs. A double casing turbine has a casing within a casing, or an inner and outer casing. Double casings are used with large turbine assemblies because they can be built lighter, more flexible, and more responsive to the large temperature and pressure changes that occur in the large unit. In a double casing, steam fills the space between the inner and outer casings. Because the steam fills this space, the temperature and pressure difference between the steam in the turbine and the air surrounding the turbine is distributed over two walls instead of one wall, as it is in a single casing. With temperature and pressure difference being distributed between two casing walls, each wall can be constructed to withstand a smaller amount of pressure and temperature difference between inside and out. The inner casing of a double casing turbine provides the same function that a single casing does. They contain the turbine nozzle block and the rest of the fixed blading. Whether it's contained within a single casing or a double casing turbine, the nozzle block supplies high velocity steam for the control stage of the turbine. A nozzle block is similar to the other fixed blading. There's one major difference though. In a nozzle block, the nozzles or nozzle shaped blades are separated into groups. Steam is supplied to each grouping of nozzles by individual control valves. If only one control valve is open, just the section of nozzles supplied by that valve will receive steam. On the other hand, the remainder of the fixed blades, the diaphragms, are not separated into groups. In addition to supplying high velocity steam to the moving blades, the diaphragms also act as steam seals between turbine stages. The outer ring of the diaphragm is fit into the casing restricting steam leakage between the turbine blading and the casing. In addition, a packing ring or seal is fit along the diaphragm between its inner ring and the rotor shaft restricting steam leakage along the rotor. There's a very close clearance between the fixed parts of the turbine and the moving parts of the turbine. Therefore, expansion and contraction between these parts must be uniform. If unequal expansion or contraction between these parts occurs, the fixed parts and the moving parts can come into contact with each other and cause severe damage to the unit. To ensure proper expansion and contraction of turbine components, you must follow the prescribed startup and shutdown procedures carefully. Temperatures and pressures must be monitored closely to ensure heat up and cool down rates are within the plant's design limits. To provide further protection during turbine shutdown procedures, most turbines are equipped with a turning gear. After the steam supply has been cut off, the rotor is allowed to coast, slowly reducing its rotational speed. When rotation is nearly stopped, the turning gear takes over and continues rotor rotation. This ensures temperature equalization across the rotor as it cools down. If the rotor doesn't cool evenly, one side will contract faster than the other side, resulting in a bow or bend in the rotor. A turning gear prevents this type of rotor damage. Well, we've looked at the two types of rotor assemblies, the construction of moving blading and fixed blading, the alternatives for turbine casing, and we talked about how these components are prepared to handle the stress of the energy conversion process. Now is a good time to review this material in your text and answer the questions. Take the time to ask your instructor to clear up any questions you may have. As the demands for electricity have increased, it has become necessary to supply power plants with larger and larger turbine units. Concerns about turbine efficiency have led to the design of large units for operation at higher temperatures and pressures.
Small turbines, which operate with relatively low temperatures and pressures, may consist of a single cylinder. A cylinder refers to the turbine rotor assembly and the turbine casing as a unit. However, when temperatures and pressures are higher, as in most modern turbines, it becomes difficult to design a single cylinder unit that can handle the large temperature and pressure changes that occur between the inlet and the outlet. With a typical inlet temperature of about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit at a pressure of 2,400 PSIA, steam volume is about 0.3 cubic feet per pound. At the turbine exhaust, steam temperature may decrease to 100 degrees Fahrenheit at a pressure below 1 PSIA. Under these exhaust conditions, steam volume increases to about 333 cubic feet per pound. Steam volume has increased about 1,000 times. This means that a single cylinder turbine would have to have an exhaust area that is 1,000 times larger than its inlet area. Since this large change in volume is difficult to accommodate in a single cylinder unit, most modern turbines use multi-cylinder arrangements. Let's look at some typical multi-cylinder arrangements that can be found in power plants today. A multi-cylinder turbine consists of two or more single cylinder units. Their rotors may be coupled together to form a single rotor assembly or it may have a single shaft. Two cylinder turbines contain a high pressure cylinder and a low pressure cylinder. The low pressure cylinder is frequently a double flow unit in which steam enters in the center and flows outward in both directions. Along with the increasing demands for electricity and consequently larger turbine units to fill those demands, it has become necessary to add reheat steam systems to many units to increase efficiency. When a reheat steam system is used, an intermediate pressure cylinder is introduced. This is a typical three-cylinder turbine unit showing a high pressure cylinder, an intermediate pressure cylinder, and a double flow low pressure cylinder. Steam flows through the high pressure cylinder, back to the boiler, through the reheater, into the intermediate pressure cylinder, and on through the low pressure cylinder from which it is exhausted into the condenser. In most cylinder arrangements like this one, the high pressure and intermediate pressure cylinders are usually arranged for steam counterflow. In other words, steam flows through the intermediate pressure cylinder in the opposite direction than in the high pressure cylinder. This steam flow arrangement helps turbine thrust bearings to maintain the rotor's axial position. Thrust, or axial movement of the turbine rotor assembly, is always in the direction of steam flow with steam flowing in one direction through the high pressure cylinder and in the other direction through the intermediate pressure cylinder, the thrusting force on the rotor is more balanced. The same effect is also accomplished in a double flow low pressure cylinder. This counter flow high pressure intermediate pressure and double flow low pressure combination is very common in power plants today. However, in still larger units, it becomes necessary to build larger high pressure and intermediate pressure cylinders and to add additional low pressure cylinders. The cylinder arrangements we've discussed so far are commonly known as tandem compound arrangements. In a tandem compound arrangement, the rotor shafts of each cylinder are coupled together to make one common shaft that drives one generator. Another cylinder arrangement that is sometimes used for large turbines is called a cross-compound arrangement. A cross-compound arrangement has two shafts that drive two generators. In this typical cross-compound arrangement, we have a high-pressure cylinder and a double-flow intermediate pressure cylinder on one shaft, which drives one generator. On another shaft are two double-flow low-pressure cylinders that drive another generator. Steam flows through the high pressure cylinder and then through the reheat system. Then it is returned to the intermediate pressure cylinder. 
being admitted to the center and flowing through the cylinder in both directions. Steam is exhausted from the intermediate pressure cylinder through two pipes that lead to the center of each low pressure cylinder. Steam flows through each low pressure cylinder in two directions and is then exhausted to the condenser. So, in a cross compound cylinder arrangement, we actually have two machines coupled by a common steam system. The cylinder arrangements we've looked at are commonly found in today's power plants. You probably find similar arrangements in your plant. It's a good idea to know which type of cylinder arrangement your plant has so that you'll better understand how steam flows through the turbine. This will make it easier to understand how the whole system works. For now, review the information on cylinder arrangement in your text and answer the questions at the end of that section. Ask your instructor to help you with any problems you have. And when we come back, we'll talk about turbine efficiency. As a power plant operator, one of your major concerns is maintaining a high level of efficiency in your plant's turbines. As you may already know, plant efficiency is a comparison between the amount of energy supplied to the system in the form of fuel and the amount of energy leaving the system in the form of electricity. Ideally, all of the energy contained in the fuel supplied to the boiler would be converted into electrical energy, but this just doesn't happen natural energy losses occur throughout the plant cycle. A great deal of energy is lost from the steam as it passes through the turbine section of the steam cycle. It's part of your job to see that those energy losses are kept to a minimum. So let's take a look at steam flow through the turbine and see how you can help make turbine operation as efficient as possible. As we said before, the size of turbine blading increases greatly between the inlet and the outlet. This increase in blade size is necessary due to the large temperature and pressure drops that are required to convert the energy of steam into rotating mechanical energy. As steam pressure drops, steam volume expands, so the blades of the turbine must be large enough to receive the total steam volume. If we consider typical steam pressures, temperatures, and corresponding volumes, we can appreciate the large change in volume that occurs across the turbine. For example, let's look at a typical high pressure cylinder. At the turbine inlet, you may have steam pressure of 2,400 PSIA and a temperature of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam under these conditions would have a specific volume of about 0.3214 cubic feet per pound. At the high pressure cylinder outlet, pressure could drop to about 540 PSIA with a temperature of about 485 degrees Fahrenheit. This corresponds to a specific volume of about 0.8772 cubic feet per pound. Under these circumstances, steam volume increases across the high pressure cylinder approximately 2.7 times. On the other hand, if we look at a typical low pressure cylinder, we could find an inlet pressure of about 130 PSIA and a temperature of about 355 degrees Fahrenheit. This corresponds to a specific volume of about 3.5 cubic feet per pound. While at the turbine exhaust, the pressure may be below one PSIA with a temperature of about 100 degrees Fahrenheit which gives the steam a specific volume of approximately 333 cubic feet per pound. This means that steam volume across the low pressure cylinder increases about 95 times. The increase in steam volume across later on. On this turbine, resetting is accomplished by pulling a reset handle located on the front standard of the turbine. To understand how pulling the reset handle affects the turbine, let's take a look at a simplified representation of the turbine. 
pulling the reset handle allows hydraulic oil pressure to reach the actuators of the main stop valves, the control valves, the reheat stop valves, and the intercept valves. The hydraulic oil pressure opens the reheat stop valves and intercept valves. The hydraulic oil also allows the control valves to be positioned by the operator. If you remember, each control valve feeds a different section of the nozzle block, and the turbine we're dealing with is started by admitting steam through all of the nozzle block sections. This is called full arc admission. If the turbine started with full arc admission, the control valves have to be fully opened. The control valves are opened by turning the governor control switch to the raised position. Although the reheat stop valves, intercept valves, and control valves are opened at this time, the main stop valves are still closed, despite the hydraulic oil pressure. There are two reasons that the main stop valves do not open. The first reason is that an interlock prevents full oil pressure from being admitted to the hydraulic actuators of the stop valves until the stop valve bypass is wide open. The second reason is that steam pressure from the boiler helps hold them closed. At this time, the main stop valves are the only valves keeping steam from reaching the turbine. The other valves are open. We'll see how the main stop valves are open later in this program. Well, we've now completed the steps necessary to get the turbine ready for the admission of steam. But again, the steps we've covered apply to a specific turbine and specific startup conditions. However, the corresponding procedures for your plant will be similar. This is a good time to familiarize yourself with these procedures by relating them to what you've learned here. You can also review these initial startup responsibilities by studying the information in your text. After you've had a chance to do that, we'll move forward in the startup sequence by warming the turbine up and bringing it up to speed. When a turbine is reset and its valves are properly positioned, startup continues. Steam is supplied to the turbine. It's warmed up and it's brought up to rated speed. How operators typically handle these responsibilities is what we'll be looking at next. In general, warming a turbine occurs before, during, and after the turbine is brought up to rated speed. However, to make the warm-up and speed increase easier to understand, we'll go over them separately. Basically, warming a turbine during startup is accomplished by opening the stop valve bypass and supplying steam. However, the way this is done is important. The key to warming a turbine in a safe, controlled manner is to admit steam slowly and gradually. As a turbine is warmed, it expands. If it's warmed too quickly, some parts could expand faster than others. Uneven expansion could result in contact of stationary and moving parts. In addition, if turbine metal is warmed too fast, it could crack. Turbine manufacturers and plant policies establish warm-up procedures. If a turbine is warmed according to procedure, the rate of expansion should be roughly equal throughout the turbine. Essentially, there are two different temperature considerations an operator should keep track of to minimize uneven expansion and prevent cracking. One is the difference in temperature between the steam and the metal. The difference between steam and metal temperature is often called steam to metal temperature mismatches. To help ensure that the steam to metal mismatches are as close as possible to specifications, the temperature of the steam leaving the boiler is coordinated with the temperature of the turbine metal. The second temperature consideration an operator has to be aware of is the rates at which the turbine metal temperature can increase over a given period of time. These are known as warm-up rates. Let's discuss warm-up rates further by relating them to the turbine we've been using as an example. For this turbine, there are two distinct warming phases. The first is called pre-warming. Pre-warming for this turbine is a gradual increase in first stage metal temperature to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The turbine is on turning gear during the entire pre-warming period. 
the slow rotation of the rotor on turning gear helps to heat the rotor evenly and minimizes eccentricity. The second warm-up phase begins when the turbine is rolled off of turning gear at 300 degrees, and it continues until the turbine is at full load temperature, which for this turbine is a first stage metal temperature of 1,000 degrees. Now, the first warm-up phase, pre-warming, is often expressed in terms of the time required to reach a certain temperature. In our example, pre-warming will start with the turbine at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and will last until the metal temperature is 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The plant procedures for this turbine require that pre-warming from 75 to 300 degrees take at least three and one half hours. The second phase is usually expressed in terms of the maximum amount the turbine metal temperature can be increased each hour. This degree per hour rate is often called a ramp rate. For this turbine, the procedures require that the first stage metal temperature should not be increased at more than 160 degrees per hour. In both warming phases, the turbine must be heated up at a steady, consistent rate. That is, without too much of a temperature increase at any one time. Let's see now what an operator can do to warm up a turbine and stay within the specified pre-warming and ramp rates. One method an operator can use to help stay within the warm-up rates is to draw a reference line on the chart paper for the turbine metal temperature recorder and use the line as a guide. In many cases, several different temperature readings are recorded on recorders like this, but for our purposes, we'll consider only the turbine's first stage metal temperature. For this example, an operator's objective would be to pre-warm the turbine from 75 degrees to 300 degrees in no less than three and a half hours. In this case, pre-warming starts at 12 o'clock. To guide the operator, a straight line could be drawn between the points where pre-warming begins and ends. That is, from 75 degrees at 12 o'clock to 300 degrees three and a half hours later, which is 3.30. Then, during the second warm-up phase, he has to increase the temperature to 1,000 degrees at a rate not to exceed 160 degrees per hour. Another straight line could be drawn between the points where the second warm-up phase begins and ends, from 300 degrees at 3.30 to 1,000 degrees at a rate not to exceed 160 degrees per hour. The operator has figured out that the second warm-up phase should take about four and a half hours or until about eight o'clock. As the operator admits steam by adjusting the stop valve bypass, he could refer to the lines on the recorder and try to stay as close to the lines as possible. In this case, the readings on the recorder do not deviate significantly from the line, so the turbine is being warmed at the proper rate. We should emphasize that an operator monitors many conditions during both phases of a turbine warm-up. For example, the operator must be careful during the pre-warming phase not to let in so much steam that the turning gear disengages, which could result in the rotor not being heated properly. Most turning gears are designed to disengage automatically when the rotor reaches a certain speed. If this happens, the operator should close the stop valve bypass to slow the turbine down and put the turning gear back on. The operator should also keep his eye on the differential expansion recorder during both warm-up phases. If this recorder indicates that turbine metal is expanding unevenly or at a rate that's not within plant standards, he should either slow down or stop the temperature increase accordingly. Now, by the time a turbine is up to its full load temperature, the speed raising process has already been completed. At this point, Let's go back and see how a turbine is brought up to rated speed. At the beginning of the speed raising procedure, when the metal temperature is about 300 degrees, and the rotor is still turning at a slow turning gear speed, the turning gear is disengaged. On this turbine, just enough steam is let in through the stop valve bypass to cause the rotor to speed up slightly and disengage the turning gear. When it's been verified that the turning gear has disengaged, 
the turning gear motor is turned off. When the turning gear disengages, the force of the steam turns the rotor. Continuing to use the stop valve bypass, the operator admits steam at the appropriate rate to increase turbine speed. While turbine speed is being increased, there are several important responsibilities an operator may have to carry out. Some of these include sounding out the turbine, heat soaking, handling critical speeds, and checking the output of the main oil pump. To understand what an operator should know or do for each of these examples, let's go over them one at a time. First, soon after rolling off of turning gear, the operator closes the stop valve bypass and sounds out the turbine again. Closing the stop valve bypass should prevent the noise of the steam flow from drowning out any abnormal noises that may be present. Next, the operator reopens the stop valve bypass to start letting steam into the turbine again. In addition to being sounded out, sometimes the turbine will need one or more heat soaks during startup. Heat soaking a turbine means to hold the speed of the turbine constant for a length of time specified by the manufacturer. The speed of the turbine is held constant by maintaining the flow of steam through the turbine constant. Heat soaks are often required if steam to metal temperature mismatches are not kept within the acceptable limits. Holding the turbine speed constant allows the steam to metal temperature mismatch to be brought within an acceptable range. Although heat soaks aren't always required, watching out for and dealing with critical speeds is. Critical speeds are certain speeds at which the rotor will vibrate excessively. Critical speeds vary from one turbine to another, but for a given turbine, critical speeds will usually occur at certain RPM. For example, if a turbine has a critical speed at 1900 RPM, the vibration will always be excessive whenever the turbine is running at that speed. For this turbine, there is a critical speed at 1900 RPM. Since a symptom of critical speed is excessive vibration, critical speed can be determined from a vibration recorder. At this speed, the indication on the vibration recorder is around the 6 to 8 mil level, which is well beyond the normal level for this turbine. When a turbine reaches critical speed, an operator should increase the acceleration rate of the turbine to roll through the critical speed quickly. As we've seen, the speed is increased by opening the stop valve bypass. As this is done, the operator checks the vibration recorder to see when the vibration has returned to normal. Once it has, the turbine has passed the critical speed and the operator can continue to increase the speed of the turbine at the specified rate. In addition to critical speed, another turbine condition an operator keeps track of during startup is the output of the main oil pump. This is typically done just before the turbine has reached rated speed. Basically, the operator checks the main oil pump discharge pressure to see if the pressure is sufficient to lubricate the turbine properly. When the operator verifies that the main oil pump discharge pressure is sufficient, he turns off the motor-driven oil pump. In addition to the turbine conditions we've just seen, Remember that an operator also has to keep monitoring the rate of temperature increase as the speed increases. And if the turbine's warming up too fast, he has to act accordingly. When a turbine has reached its rated speed, which in this case is 3600 RPM, its generator is connected to the power system and it starts to carry load. In addition, control of steam flow is transferred from the stop valve bypass to the control valves. We'll discuss load changes and transferring control to the control valves when we come back. For now, review what we've learned about temperature and speed increases by reading over the appropriate material in your text. Ask your instructor for help if you need it. When a turbine's generator is connected to the power system, the operation of the turbine, the generator, and the power system have to be carefully coordinated with each other to produce electrical power efficiently and safely. However, since this process involves many procedures that aren't directly associated with the turbine itself or with the typical turbine operator, we won't go into it here. What we'll focus our attention on 
are the steps necessary to complete a turbine startup procedure. For the turbine we've been using as an example, this will entail primarily increasing load on the turbine and transferring the control of steam flow from the stop valve bypass to the control valves. With this in mind, let's complete the turbine startup procedure. When a turbine and generator are connected to the power system, in many plants the closing of the turbine drains begins. Which drains are closed may depend on the amount of load being carried. Check with your instructor to learn what the procedure is in your plant. In this example, after the drains have been positioned properly, the operator increases load by gradually admitting steam through the stop valve bypass. When a turbine's generator is connected to the power system, there's a limit to how much the load can be changed at any one time. Rapid load changes can lead to rapid temperature changes in the turbine, and rapid temperature changes can lead to turbine problems we've seen before, such as uneven expansion and contraction of the metal parts. Therefore, when increasing load at this point in the startup, an operator should not exceed the limits specified in the startup instructions and in his plant's procedure. For our turbine, this limit is 5 megawatts per minute. The operator must also make sure that the metal temperature increases are kept under control and are within the required levels. In addition to monitoring temperature, he must also keep track of the stop valve bypass position. Many plants have bypass position indicators similar to this one. The operator will increase load at the appropriate rate until the pointer on the indicator reaches the transfer point. In many plants, transfer occurs at a predetermined load. Up to this point in the startup, the operator has been controlling steam flow with the stop valve bypass. However, the bypass valve is a small valve and cannot admit full steam flow even when it's wide open. To carry more load, steam flow must increase. This is accomplished by opening the main stop valves and transferring control of the steam flow to the control valves. The stage of the startup at which this occurs is called the transfer point. To understand what an operator has to do at the transfer point and to see how his actions affect what's going on inside the turbine, let's take a look at a typical transfer procedure. As we work our way through the sequence, we'll be using simplified illustrations of a turbine to help us understand the process better. As you may recall, when the turbine was reset, certain valves were opened. They included the intercept valves, the reheat stop valves, and the control valves. But the main stop valves did not open because steam pressure held them closed. This is a more detailed representation of a main stop valve and control valves. These are hydraulic valve actuators. This is the main stop valve disc. And this is the stop valve bypass disc. Steam from the boiler enters the main stop valve through this line. The pressure of the steam in this line is indicated on a pressure gauge. This gauge may be called a throttle pressure or before seat pressure gauge. These holes in the main stop valve disc provide a path for steam flow through the bypass. Steam leaves the valve through this line, which is connected to the control valves. The pressure in this line is often called after seat pressure, and it's indicated on another gauge. The main stop valve disc is held closed because the steam pressure above it is substantially higher than the steam pressure below it. To increase steam flow, the operator will open the main stop valve. This is done by decreasing the difference between these pressures. The operator does this by closing the control valves using the governor control switch. As the control valves are closed, the steam pressure between the main stop valves and the control valves increases. The reading on the after seat gauge increases as steam pressure builds up between the main stop valves and control valves. The operator continues to close the control valves with the governor control switch until a slight decrease in load results. The decrease in load is indicated on a megawatt recorder and it tells the operator that the control valves are throttling steam flow. Next. 
the stop valve bypass is run to the full open position. When the stop valve bypass is fully opened, the difference in pressure between the steam on top of the stop valve and the steam beneath the stop valve continues to decrease. Eventually, it decreases enough so that the hydraulic pressure in the valve's actuator can raise the main stop valve disc. At this point, steam flow to the turbine increases and control of the turbine has transferred from the stop valve bypass to the control valves. Any further load change will be made by the operation of the control valves. Now that the control valves have control of the turbine, the turbine is ready to do its part in meeting the power demands of the system. Any further load increases will be determined by the load dispatcher, according to the needs of the power system. Even though the turbine is carrying load, it still may not be up to full operating temperature. If this were the case, the operator would continue to heat the turbine according to the ramp rate. He does this by coordinating the operation of the turbine with the operation of the boiler. Well, now that we've worked our way through some of the major steps in a typical startup procedure, this is a good time to take a break and read over this section of your text. You should also relate the startup procedures we've covered so far in the program to the procedures you'll have to apply in your own plant. When we come back, we'll see some of the things an operator should look for when a turbine is carrying load. To keep a turbine running safely and efficiently when it's online and carrying load, there are many turbine conditions an operator has to monitor closely and, if necessary, react to. For our purposes, it's not practical or even possible to cover them all, so we'll confine our treatment of the subject to a few major concerns regarding turbine operations under load. However, as you gain more experience as an operator, you'll learn more and more about the wide varieties of responsibilities an operator has during normal turbine operation. You'll also develop a knack for dealing with the special considerations in your plant that may require extra attention. In this part of the program, we'll examine three important turbine conditions. Improper lube oil temperature, low condenser vacuum, and water induction. We've chosen these three primarily because all of them are relevant to the vast majority of turbines and all of them affect turbine operation. We'll investigate these topics one at a time. However, before we get into specifics, another general point needs to be brought out. What's abnormal for one turbine is not necessarily abnormal for another. So specific readings and actions that are shown here might not apply in all cases. However, they can be helpful in illustrating some general principles of safe and effective turbine operation. With this in mind, Let's discuss why a turbine's lubricating oil must be at the proper temperature. One reason the lube oil temperature is important is because the lubricating oil usually has to be within a certain temperature range to provide adequate bearing lubrication. If the lube oil temperature is either too high or too low, it won't lubricate the bearings properly. Without proper lubrication, the bearings may not be able to hold the rotor in the correct position. This could result in damage to the bearings. Bearing damage, in turn, could cause the rotor to vibrate excessively when it rotates, damaging the turbine. As an operator, you'll have to monitor the lube oil temperature. Improper lube oil temperature can often be an indication of other problems. For example, if the oil temperature at each bearing is above or below its normal range, the problem is likely to be with the lube oil supply system. However, if the lube oil temperature increases at only one bearing, it's more likely that something is wrong with the bearing itself. In addition to checking for improper lube oil temperature, an operator also has to watch out for problems with the vacuum level in the condenser. If the vacuum is reduced, the efficiency of the turbine will also be reduced. In addition, operating a turbine at too low a vacuum could damage the turbine. To prevent damage, Many turbines are designed to trip automatically if the vacuum decreases to a certain level. Although there are several factors that can lead to an abnormally low condenser vacuum, two common causes are circulating water that's too warm and clogged condenser tubes. 
If the circulating water temperature gets above a certain point, its ability to remove heat from the steam and thus condense it is diminished. We said earlier, the condensation of steam creates vacuum in a turbine. If the steam is not being condensed as efficiently as it should be, the vacuum in the condenser will be reduced. Now, if the circulating water is too dirty, it could cause vacuum problems because the flow of circulating water through the condenser could be restricted. If the condenser tubes become clogged with dirt or other debris, and the flow of circulating water is obstructed, there may not be enough water in the condenser to effectively condense the steam. And this could reduce the vacuum in the condenser. At this point, having gone over some of the effects and causes of reduced vacuum, let's see what an operator can do about it. Since an increase in circulating water temperature can cause a decrease in vacuum, an operator should keep a close watch on the circulating water temperature. If the temperature gets hot enough to cause a reduction in vacuum, there are several courses of action an operator can take to get the vacuum level back up. One possible solution is to increase the amount of circulating water. On this unit, this is done by simply turning on another circulating water pump. Although the temperature of the water from the additional pump may still be higher than normal, there will be more water available to condense the steam. The extra water should aid in the condensation process and therefore help to increase the vacuum. Turning on an extra circulating water pump may work in plants with an open circulating water system. However, it might only be a temporary solution in plants with a closed circulating water system. In this case, you may have to investigate why the circulating water isn't being cooled. Now, decreasing load is another possible solution to low vacuum caused by abnormally warm circulating water. This is done with the governor control switch, which reduces the amount of steam flowing into the condenser. The less steam there is in the condenser, the easier it is for the circulating water to condense it. As the rate of condensation returns to normal, the vacuum should too. Although decreasing load can take care of a vacuum problem, it shouldn't be done indiscriminately. Any load changes should be done according to plant procedure and in coordination with the system dispatcher. The other potential cause of vacuum problems we mentioned earlier was clogged condenser tubes. To determine if the condenser tubes are clogged enough to restrict the circulation of water, an operator can check the pressure of the water as it enters the condenser. For example, if the condenser tubes are blocked by debris and the water can't circulate like it should through the condenser, the pressure of the water going into the condenser will increase. Sometimes the condenser tubes can be unblocked by reversing the water flow through the condenser. However, some plants require that the turbine be shut down and the condenser be cleaned if the water pressure increases to a predetermined level. To complete our discussion of potentially damaging turbine conditions, we're going to look into the problem of water induction. In simplest terms, Water induction is water getting into a turbine. Water that gets into a turbine can cause a tremendous amount of damage. For example, water droplets can have a bullet-like effect on fast-spinning hot turbine blades. The droplets can chip off pieces of the blades. In addition, when water comes into contact with turbine metal that's significantly hotter than the water, the result could be uneven contraction of the turbine metal and the type of damage we've seen before. Like the other turbine conditions we've investigated, water induction can also be caused by several factors, but we'll examine only one here. We'll see how water could conceivably back up into a turbine through extraction lines that connect a turbine to a feed water heater. To see how this might happen, let's take a look at a simplified illustration of a feed water heater system. The major components of this particular system are a turbine section, and the feed water heater. Connecting the turbine to the heater is an extraction line with a steam supply valve in it. Inside the heater are tubes. Water enters the heater through a feed water inlet valve, flows through the tubes, and leaves the heater through a feed water outlet valve. In addition, Condensed steam is drained out of the heater through a drain line.
finally, this system has a feed water bypass line. For simplicity, we're showing a cross section of only one feed water heater and its piping. However, plants usually have several feed water heaters. During normal operation, steam from the turbine is sent through the extraction line to the feed water heater. Feed water passes through tubes in the heater and absorbs heat from the steam. The steam condenses into water and falls to the bottom of the heater where it's drained off. During normal operation, the water level is maintained in the heater by a drain system. However, in the event of a severe heater tube leak, the amount of water may exceed the capacity of the drain system. If so, it's possible that the water could enter the turbine through the extraction line. To prevent this type of water induction, an operator has to recognize the appropriate warning signs and take the proper corrective action. In many plants, a high feed water heater level will actuate an alarm in the control room. When the alarm flashes, the heater must be removed from service or bypassed to avoid the possibility of the water backing up through the extraction line and entering the turbine. The heater is bypassed by first opening the bypass valve. Then the feed water inlet and outlet valves to the heater and the steam supply valve in the extraction line are closed. When the valves are in these positions, feed water is routed around the heater, preventing it from entering the turbine. As we said before, water induction, low condenser vacuum, and bearing problems make up only a small percentage of the turbine conditions an operator has to watch out for during turbine operation. And the systems and procedures we've seen here may vary from plant to plant. However, in all cases, an operator should follow his plant's procedure whenever an abnormal turbine condition arises. To get a broader appreciation and understanding of the operational procedures in your plant, discuss them with your instructor. When you've had a chance to do that, and after you've read your text, We'll continue. Now that we've seen how to start up a turbine, and a few things to watch for when a turbine is carrying load, we'll switch our emphasis to turbine shutdowns. Basically, a turbine is shut down when its generator is separated from the power system and steam flow to the turbine is shut off. Turbines can be shut down in different ways for different reasons. For example, if a turbine has to be shut down for maintenance and it's known that it will be out of service for a while, the procedure will be somewhat different than if a turbine has to be shut down in an emergency or with the intention of restarting it soon. However, a lot of the major steps required to shut down a turbine apply in most situations. The procedure we'll go through is for a turbine that's going to be shut down for maintenance. Remember though, some of the specific steps shown here may not be done exactly the same way in your plant. The operator begins this type of shutdown by decreasing load at the rate specified by plant procedures. He does this by turning the governor control switch to the decrease position. He checks the rate of decrease by referring to a megawatt recorder. Next he'll decrease the steam temperature by reducing the amount of fuel sent to the boiler. Decreasing the steam temperature decreases the metal temperature. The metal temperature is generally decreased at the same rate it's increased during startup. For this turbine, it's 160 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. This minimizes steam to metal temperature mismatches and uneven contraction of the metal parts. During shutdowns, Operators should carefully monitor certain conditions to ensure that the turbine is being cooled at the proper rate. They include steam temperature, metal temperatures, and differential expansion. Soon after the load starts to decrease, some turbine manufacturers recommend that some of the drains be opened to prevent moisture from entering the turbine. This may be necessary because at lower loads, the steam temperature could decrease enough to cause the steam to condense. The condensation could damage the turbine. Keep in mind, though, that the turbine drains may be opened at different times for different turbines. Check to find out what the procedure is in your plant. 
Now, some manufacturers also require that the motor-driven oil pump be turned on before the turbine is tripped. This ensures that the turbine will be lubricated when the discharge pressure of the main oil pump decreases as the rotor slows down. Once the load on the turbine has decreased to a certain level determined by the manufacturer's instructions, the turbine is tripped. For this turbine, the load should be no greater than 10 megawatts. This turbine can be tripped in three ways. By pressing a solenoid trip button, by pulling a manual trip handle, or by pulling an oil trip handle. When the turbine trips, the steam valves close. As we said, tripping the turbine cuts off the flow of steam. Since steam turns the rotor, the rotor will start to slow down when the turbine's tripped. When the rotor coasts down to a certain speed, some plants recommend opening the vacuum breaker. Opening the vacuum breaker allows air into the turbine, and the resistance of the air against the spinning turbine blades helps the rotor to coast down quicker. If the blades spin in a vacuum or without air resistance, a much longer coast down time is required. However, the vacuum breaker should not be opened when the rotor is turning at a high speed. At high speeds, air striking the turbine blades creates a lot of friction, possibly causing the last stage blades to overheat. For this turbine, the speed should be no greater than half of full speed. That is, about 1,800 RPM or less before opening the vacuum breaker. When condenser vacuum is reduced to zero, the gland seal system can be taken out of service by closing the steam seal supply valve and turning off the exhausters. If the sealing system is taken off while there's still vacuum, cool air could be drawn along the hot rotor, possibly causing distortion. When the turbine has coasted down to a standstill, it's put on turning gear. Running on turning gear at this time will help to prevent distortion of the rotor and provides even cooling of the rotor. When the turbine metal temperature falls below a certain level designated by the manufacturer, the turbine is taken off of turning gear. When the rotor has come to a stop, the motor-driven oil pump is shut off. The turbine is now shut down and should be ready for maintenance. We said before that the turbine shutdown procedure may be different if the turbine will be started up again soon or if it has to be tripped immediately to prevent major damage. If it's known that a turbine is going to be restarted soon, it's advantageous to keep it as warm as possible when shutting it down. Keeping a turbine warm during shutdown will allow it to be started up quicker and easier later because the metal won't have to be heated as much. It's also advantageous for this type of shutdown to keep the turbine on turning gear during the shutdown period. In fact, a turbine is generally kept on turning gear at all times unless the turbine shut down for maintenance. Running on turning gear helps to keep the rotor straight and at roughly the same temperature throughout the rotor. Even though a turbine can be kept warm for shutdowns of relatively short duration, it's still necessary to decrease the load on the turbine at a safe rate during the shutdown process. However, in emergency situations, situations cause permanent damage to the turbine if it continues to operate, the turbine has to be tripped immediately at whatever load it happens to be carrying. Your instructor will tell you what these situations are and when immediate trips are necessary. At this point, having seen how turbines are typically started up, what an operator might look for during normal operation, and how turbines are shut down, you should have a better understanding of some important general principles of turbine operation. As an operator, you'll apply these principles by working through the procedures yourself. And as you do, be sure to follow the relevant instruction sheets and plant requirements. However, even plant procedures and a manufacturer's instruction manual can't cover every event or do the job for you. Safe and efficient operation requires that you must continually call on your training, experience, and good sense.